Okay, well, go ahead. Sorry. Um, well, welcome on behalf of Louder Than Words, um, and it's an absolute pleasure uh, for me to introduce to you the one and only Mr. Steve Howe. Hello there. Hi, Darren. How are you doing? How are I'm, everybody I'm, out there? I'm not bad. It's lovely to speak to you. And um, you, you, you're doing all right at the moment? Yeah, yeah. Covering, you know, the possibilities and the realities that we face each day. And uh, it's tough, you know, it's tough sure. for everybody. Very, very well, tough. All your dates, though, are back to next year that you would have had this year? Well, we put them on to next year, but, you know, it's not looking so good. You know, we haven't made an official announcement, but I think a lot of things are moving on to you know 2022 but you know it's beyond our control that's all of course, we can say. Of course. we'd love um, to be out again really, yeah. and knowing your work rate have you recorded sort of 400 albums since you've been in in lockdown <laughs> i can't say too much about that but yeah i've been keeping busy and fortunately i did a little upgrade on my studio last year so it's become a kind of haven of uh, possibilities, you know, sure. and uh, so yeah, mum's the word there. Of course. Well, you're only sharing it with us and the whole of the internet. Um, so this yeah, is course. the fabulous book. Um, nice jacket. This is like a sort of baseball jacket, American baseball jacket. Yeah, I'm just trying to think if I can remember who designed that. Yeah, it, I picked it up somewhere. I really liked it. Yeah, it was nice. It's, it's great... not actually like that at all. It's quite European in a, in a way because it's got these kind of soft sleeves and things. Yeah, sure. it's unusual. Sure, no, it's it's really the part. And the, so the book came out. I was amazed. It was much earlier this year because I had the pleasure of reviewing it for Record Collector, and it was like April time around well, there. So... It was due to come out in April, and they were so geared up that they just said, "Look, that, that, that we don't have a reason other than, of course, there is a terrible reason, but you know, we're all geared up, so let's move." So I said, "Yeah," and I'm pleased we did. It gave some gave people something to read in the lockdown. I mean. <laughs> You must have been asked to do a book many times in, in your past. Um, it might have been floated. You know, I met a journalist once. I remember he said, oh, if you want to do a book, you're not clever. You do it. And I guess, uh, you know, it, uh, nothing ever really came very solidly about it, other than I enjoyed doing my uh, Steve Howe guitar collection book. That was mm. a real, uh, you know, sort of um, <clears throat> pipe dream. To do that so that was marvelous and i worked with mickey slingsby the photographer and tony bacon so sure. that was I, I i got a few of the ropes going there but that was um that was nothing like you know what i did when i wrote this mm. and uh, so how did it how did it come about how what did what made you finally decide to uh, take yeah. the plunge well a funny thing it was almost a spontaneous moment it was 2009 and i've been lucky enough to been loaned a, a chalet in Switzerland on a mountain nice. and like I was sitting there and I suddenly realized I had about three weeks where I really didn't have any plans you know so I, I just turned my attention to it and I wrote what was the kind of like infrastructure of, of the first uh, chapter where it's about my younger days you know sure. so I did the predictable thing you know I started you know like talking about when I was a kid and things so um, I did about 15,000 words and I thought, well, you know, that's a start, you know. So then I gauged for quite a few years that um, I was going to be looking for a deal and that would kind of stimulate my desire to, to, to finish it, to know it was going to come out. Of course, the world started changing, you know, internet. And, you know, I got very busy in, in, in the, the, the second decade mm. of uh, the, the, the 2000s um, with so many projects. And the book kind of was shunted, shunted back in priority, but I think it was around, then I did another stab, I think I added some more, but, but it was really meeting up with Omnibus um, through Zoe Howe, sure. and my, 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 my son Dylan's um, wife. And so we got an introduction, it was kind of nice, it felt like the right place, you know, music book people, I'm, I'm in the music business. So it really made logical sense and I much enjoyed that. You know, that's, I like, you know, some contact. <laughs> Don't mm. mention that word at the moment, but it's nice to meet people and, you know, we all know how, how normal that felt and it was totally normal and it felt close and nice. Mm. So we got on and they encouraged me and I started to put time aside in quite big chunks, you know, like months uh, here and there. I could spot a month and I'd say, well, I'll really try and get down to it. And I'm quite disciplined in that way. If I've got something to do, I get on with it. Um, mm. One of the interesting things was, although I kept, you know, like making up 
little tunes and dittying around on the guitar. I didn't really construct a great deal of my kind of demo structures where I, I, I put pieces together and record them. And th they lay kind of waiting because I found that left, right side of my brain, um, they were, it was occupied, you know, the part of me that, that, that built it because I was building a book instead. Right. Sure. So after when the book finished and I was really done with it uh, middle of last year completely, then I had this outpouring of uh, musical ideas. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I, a little did I know that uh, I could have even more time on it than that because yes, we're planned last year and we, this is what we did. We worked in the first half of the year kind of hard and then sure. we took the second half off. So that allowed me, fortunately, I'd, I'd virtually finished a book and it was just, you know, the, the quite elongated stage of the design and, and the corrections and, you know, lawyers' recommendations <laughs> and little things like, you know, uh, tidying it all up and getting, I mean, that's really one of the harder parts of the book, to be quite honest. Sure. But um, yeah, I mean, it was it was fun to write. Uh, I, I mean, maybe your next question is, you know, well, you, you asked me how how it kind of came about, and that's yeah, yeah. how it came about. Sure. Um, but when it came down to more like 2015, 2016, then you know that was really then compelling to to really you know do more work and and, and do a bit more research and kind of get the style of the book going, and then you know some some collaboration you know as i was going along i was collaborating with um, chris uh, uh, the, 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 one of the editors and basically we kind of you know chris charlesworth we kind of like m made some progress and then we did some more refinement later and uh, it was quite a collaborative project even though i mean i did write it all on my laptop you know there, there was uh, it was real there was no ghost I wrote, I wrote it on pages you know which is a, a an apple kind of oh yeah yeah so I, I kind of like that format. And um, so why did I write it? I suppose might be the next question. I, it... <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to answer my own questions, but it, it kind of leads on from one thing to oh, another. I, I wasn't going to ask that, but please tell me, why did you? Um, I, I wasn't sure until that time up in the chalet that, that I'd ever had the burning desire to write a book. And then I guess I had a little bit of reflective time and I look back and I, I could still remember some stuff. You know? I mean, you don't always remember the stuff you want to, but, you know, I could remember it. And I thought, well, it's not really going to be a fake book. Like, I, I, I tend to be sceptical of books that quote actual sentences from like 40 years ago, you know, and then he said this exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I, I tended to use that technique of not really, you know, being exactly specific, but, but telling a story about, uh, well, I had... Um, I've had a very busy work life in, in music and, and a very beautiful time in, in, in family um, mm. creation and, and seeing how grandchildren come along and everything. So, I mean, I've had a, a lot going on and it's been mostly beautiful. You know, we've had our disasters and sure. our, our awful moments, but basically we've, um, you know, I've combined, you know, um, this in the book to some extent, and it's not a book about my family. I couldn't write a book about them. It's, it's too much too personal you know mm. it's much too wonderful you know, i couldn't find the right words but my career and the way i interact with with other people and, and my guitar work and guitar collecting you know already there's a few topics and that's really what the book is i warn you it kind of rambles through as you know it rambles through a, a different sides of my uh, interest in music and i'm still amazed at you know 70 well i'm almost going to say 74 because it's only four three three or four months away and i'm sure. um, 74 but um, my, I still love the sound of the guitar. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if that wasn't true, then my career would have been very different, say, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, it most probably would have gone. But I think a career is also something that broadens anyway, or if you let it, or you allow it, or you encourage it, you know. And, uh, you know, I'm much more interested in production than I used to be. I'm much more flexible as a writer and even as a singer, you know. So I ba basically, um, you know, I, I feel in, in good in good shape to, to carry on, you know, being a musician. So the book really is it's packed full of crazy, crazy moments where, you know, my life was rushing by at an astounding place. And then I even took on more, you know, and I did solo stuff and I did the trio and, you know, I did all these other things because um, my music kind of, you know, 
directs me quite often and, and being a solo guitarist at times you know on my own with a guitar is is most probably the high the pinnacle for me in, in my musicality mm. even though, because a lot of that writing that i play my own compositions i think are really long-term projects to write in themselves you know things to get in the sun or you know ram or clap mood for day all these things they're all very um me and fortunately when i by the time i can record them i know them so well um so that's in the book as well it's about indicating that although what you see is what you kind of get in some respects also uh, i think for me part of the enjoyment of being a musician is being not pinned down and not being one particular thing you know even I almost define being called a rock guitarist now because you know I I, I, I like the, the the a broader definition if you like sure. of the kind of things I do. Um, sure, and I mean I think that's one thing that you 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 have so many styles. I mean you I think you say in the book you compare your work to that of a painter. Um, you know it's a very sort of painterly way of doing things, but sometimes you want to you know splash the color. Sometimes you hold the color back. Hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. I think the the you know there's everything that connects arts together, uh, and and they they you know they 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 have a very similar kind of growth, and they have a very similar kind of you know you can have success with something. Maybe this one's not so good, you know? mm. or you can nurture something for a long time and, and and create something really beautiful. And I think that that applies on on lots of different levels and one of the things i've done i guess with the guitar is, is use a sort of texturing approach where i'm not always the same guy you know mm. uh, and help to to get my music to um, have its identity through that way so um i guess parts of my book are also about the people i've met you know like i met Chet atkins who's my biggest idol who's, mm. who's my biggest uh, uh, influence i think um but you know also um a lot of the great players and modern players of today you know like Steve Morse and Albert Lee and the guys in my almost not well I'm a bit of a granddad of a guitarist really in some yeah. respect but some of these guys really uh excite me and you know I, I talk about it a bit as I go through the book besides yes I mean we haven't mentioned yes fortunately ah, yet. not yet We're about to go we'll do at some point but I have to say this picture here of you and Les Paul is just brilliant because you know, at that time, you were one of the biggest names in the world as a rock guitarist, and you're just yeah. like a fan. <laughs> you're just you, that beam of your face is just brilliant. You can see it. Absolutely, see it. Kind was of. that the first yeah. time you'd met Les Paul? Uh, that was the first time I met him on, I think, two two other occasions. Yeah, and I think I talk about him in the book. And he was always very gamey. He was up for kind of a fun. He was a kind of a trickster guy, you know. Right. He never just let me kind of, oh, hi, Steve, you want to play? You know, it was never that simple. There had to be a twist. And I think that shows his tremendous personality and, of course, his inventiveness, you know. So he always steered things, you know, in, in his own sort of Les Paul way, you know. Mm. There was a way. Certainly that was what he liked when he said to me, oh, I mainly get on with guitarists who I hang out at the bar with. So I thought, oh, that throws me out. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, you're, I mean, your opening line, you have that marvellous preamble of the, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And then that chapter two, you know, I held a dream when I was about 10 years old. I would play guitar and live life as an artist. Um, it's, it's true. I, I can't believe I had that. And it stayed with me all this time. And it most probably fueled. I was thinking about it earlier. There was a really silly time I, I hard i think i mentioned it briefly in the book where I, I and i was trying to analyze how i could have thought when i got a guitar that i could play it you know i mean yeah. people say you can't play you haven't no, no no i can play and it was like really dumb i mean it was like dumber and dumber you know built in one but it's like no no you just got this guitar and you're fumbling on it and it sounds terrible but you think you can play so that blind belief i think uh and that's quite an interesting title i might use for a piece of, piece of music because blind belief is something that's not really you know not, not re is rarely talked about mm. uh, in the sense that it, there can be something that that you can possess you can't really describe at all you know it, it's a certain belief and yeah i did have that belief i mean i don't know what 
you know, you think about, you know, the influence of like Hollywood and Hollywood movies and everything, and what artists were. But I, I wasn't really interested in, in in what I looked like and what I did. But I was definitely interested in, you know, playing the guitar and uh, and actually making that uh, what my life would be about. And and it, it did come true. So it was a you know, I, I sometimes thought, is that was that an inept statement, or was that was that a commitment also mm. you know, for me at, at, at the age of twelve? Sure, sure. And I mean, you, you, you've. I think one of the things that it's almost said in that 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 line itself that the, the book is very warm, and the evocation of certain times. I mean, the way your descriptions of London and you being sort of straight in the the heart of the scene with the syndicates and then the in crowd and then tomorrow. I mean. You were a, a sort of proper hipster, weren't you? <laughs> I was a hippie, yeah. I'm not at all ashamed to admit that. Um, I but think before he, that, he, you were you were quite sort of hip. You were a bit moddy, almost. Well, yeah. I think I went through the stages of, of, of when I when I met Keith West and I was in the in crowd. It, you know, suddenly they were quite successful, and I kind of upped my game, up my thinking a bit, and thought, well, okay, well, this is happening. You know, I mean, the syndicates were kind of struggling. Uh, but but and we were a bit kind of knack really compared to what the in crowd were like the next step up. So we we started to have fun and it was a, it was a real thing. But yeah, the style of that was was soul. We were playing kind of soul and we were kind of bit bit mods. But mm. but then as soon as you know the flower power thing happened, you know we we just jumped in the deep end really. And um, you know that that was uh, that. that I guess that allowed me to find that I could improvise a long time. Sure. <laughs> he gave me 10 minutes. I'd do something in it, you know, <laughs> I'd get on with it. And um, this, was the, uh, this was the right time to find that because this was very emotive of the sort of craziness of, of uh, the, the psychedelic music. Mm. That there would be long improvisations and um, I was I was ready to do it. I wasn't really particularly aware that I was doing it. It wasn't overly conscious, but it, I fell into it. And uh, I particularly like the drone D, you know, you used to wind the pickup pole pickup on the, the, the pickup pole on, on the D string. So we used to feed back oh, yeah, on yeah, yeah. 175 guitar. So it would feed back and but I that was like pretty Indian <laughs> it was pretty much like a sitar so yeah I got into all sorts of crazy things um but certainly had a good time as well so um it was a big learning curve um uh, and then to end end the next year by going on tour with Eric Clapton, Verlaine and Bonnie really showed me that the big time was <laughs> hopefully only around the corner um, I, there were some lulls before it between tomorrow and uh, and yes, but but this wasn't a lull. It was a very exciting time for a month to tour with uh, an act that you know sold out, you know, sold out everywhere. Sure. And uh, you know there was all sorts of rock stars around. You know, mm. George Harrison and all this. It was a beautiful, beautiful thing. And mm. um, so I guess I, I you know I was learning you know the business from a few perspectives, but uh, mainly just experience on stage and, and being part of something uh, bigger than, you know, a local band. Mm, sure, sure. And of course, your, your your journey into Yes is sort of, you know, very well known. Chris knew you from tomorrow and I think John had seen you in Bodast and yeah. uh, Pete yeah, had yeah. left and you were hunted. Mm. Yeah, I was uh, I was available. I was looking for something real hard, you know, because uh, you know things are you know were in a lull period. And it was only about two months again that kept happening, where I'd suddenly get this call and I stepped into yes. But when I got there and played with these guys, I mean, I was well impressed, you know, and uh, you know got the gig and and then felt that well, I put everything I got into this. This is a good shot, you know, and uh, everybody had so much you know personality and. And workman like, I mean, one thing, yes, it's still is it, 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 it um, encourages hard work. It, it, it isn't a band to be in if you're lazy, because we don't, we can't do that. You, you, you won't have the energy. So there's, there's, you know, there's, it's a tough requirement. And certainly in the 70s, we, we blaze through it like, uh, you know, I was gonna say like, Cavaliers or something, you know, we were kind of like taking it on board, but also building it and, and uh, meeting all the challenges and, you know, the ups and downs that did happen. But mainly the great albums that, you know, are referred to and so much part of our, our 
live catalog is, mm. is based around records like Relaya and Fragile and you know Close to the Edge, only to name three. So we had a lot of very strong ideas and Bill Bruford was part of that. And uh, of course, uh, Peter Banks started out, mm. Tony Kay was in the original thing that I joined back in 1970. And gradually, we just kept encouraging more more players, you know, mm. to, to come forward. And Patrick Moraz, you know, Wakeman, you know, Jeff Downs. It kind of like was a hot parade of uh, of musos. <laughs> I mean, it was always struck me as amazing how you work with all these different keyboard players, all you know, all household names in in their field. So from Tony to Rick to Patrick to Rick again to then to Jeff, um, and you, it's almost like there's a telepathy. I always sort of see, yes, as no one gets away with doing too much. As some, you know, everything's sort of balanced. That if the keyboards are running away, then the guitar comes in, and the, and the, you know, it's it's a beautiful balance. I mean, is that something you 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 thought about in the writing and in the playing, or did it evolve naturally? Well, I, I think it, you know, for me, it was already going when I joined. You know, mm. because I'm in the word and yes, uh, the, the first album, yes. We had great things about them, and um, basically there, there was a kind of plot. Yeah, I think. Um, well, I mean, I was going to say, well, I, I dare say we can't credit any one person with it, but I think that's not really true. I think that Chris and John, basically, when they started the band, the, they were the two, you know, who really kind of pushed the, the, the shape of it around. But to get Bill, you know, on drums and, and then get. Tony on keyboards. However, the assembly came together before yeah, yeah, me. I can't quite think what it is, but you know, I, I, I you know, it was it was a really good ship to join. You know, mm. and um, it uh, it had uh, great musical potential, and I think that's that that was my 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 main signal. And I think you know, you, you use that phrase cavaliers in the seventies. I mean, in a way in the book you almost sort of blithely move through all these situations all these things that are presented in front of you well look i'm playing with peter frampton we used to play in the small clubs now we're in you know some of the biggest stadiums in america yeah, yeah that's all right what's next you know yeah. i mean do you, yeah. do you look so, back on that and think blimey how did how, you know, yeah, how did you get away yeah. with it i mean it was like a never shifting you know, environment around you. It, it kept changing, even though it was called Yes. And thinking every time we make an album, it was somehow imprint a new kind of thing about us. So certainly, Total Graphic did that. And then even going for the one was so joyful and Swiss and all this. You know, we were all kind of on some other kind of high. As I say, they weren't all as high, but but basically, there was this um, kind of forever. Uh, Building this, building yes up to something, and, and also meeting other people who, you know, we admired and and um, you know, did things with or, or hung out with or bit, you know. So I mean, we weren't the biggest name droppers, but we were kind of, we were kind of, we liked who liked us, you know. We warmed to our fans because they, we saw them as uh, they had. A, I used to say that they had a certain ear, you know, to yeah. to, to like yes. And, you know, and sometimes exclusively like this, you know, they were kind of, they had this kind of, not twisted or distorted ear, of course, but a kind of, you know, tuneful ear, because in a way, one of the things about Yes, we did use a lot of major chords. In fact, we used a lot of chords, period. But, <laughs> but you know, we also used a lot of majors when, you know, we kind of, I joined the band when there was this kind of, era you know blues guitar priority you know there's an awful lot of great blues players you know and they're all doing it but blues have kind of become rock in a way and rock become bluesy and i guess we we were not doing that <laughs> mm. we never played the blues maybe adventure was about as bluesy as we got it was in the minor key mm. and uh, you know but it goes to majors but basically we we we, we really thought we were our own kind of you know musical entity and we were you know mm. so i i guess that being around other people, you know, who were successful, what was important, you know, like you said, with touring with Peter that year, Peter Frampton um, was was sensational, you know. And we didn't actually do a lot of, t uh, I mean, in the early days, we were opening for, you know, bands, yeah. you know, even, you know, Jake Isles or in one, once or twice ELP. So we, ha we had to build, we built very quickly. And uh, then before we knew it, we were playing all of our own shows. So um, it was only occasionally, uh, that we actually toured. I mean, we tend to have done that more in the last 10 years when we've toured with, you know, Toto and we've toured with Peter Frampton again, actually. And mm. we, we've had 
um, biannual years of doing the summer with with a, with a package, and we did mm. we did it last year with 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 um, John Lodge and and uh, Asia uh, with me with a spot, and, and also at, at ELP music from Carl. So it, it, we we know that it's good to to be around, you know, the people in our profession. It's great. Mm. Mm. And and I mean, you, you say that about yes having the inner ear. I mean, that whole thing with the Roger Dean covers, the the mysticism, the very length of the tunes, the tunes by the meter at times that that, that were there that that did set you apart. And and that musicality, you know, you look at who was near you, maybe ELP, Genesis at times. Mm -hmm. You know, Floyd were never technicians; they were marvelous players in their field, but they weren't virtuosos. You were almost in a sort of field of one, uh, maybe gentle <laughs> giant, maybe some of those more, you know, bands yeah, on the fringes. Well, I mean, what was coming was, of course, musicians who were, were even more nerdy and interested in, you know, blaring yeah. across the guitar, you know, and in the 80s, of course, you know, you had Steve Y and sure. Joe Satriani and all these guys, and, and we were a bit like, you know, gobsmack because in a way, yeah, we did have complexity and we, we did change time signatures quite often. And we muddled about with music like we had, you know, like, like we, there was no law against it and there isn't really. But I guess we, um, we, 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 um, we did our own thing and, mm. and that was really the driving force of it, that we could um, be identifiable and recognizable it was, was a nice facet. But uh, then my career moves on, you know, with with Asia and GTR. So I kind of got so much out of the seventies, you know, uh, you know, lots of success and, and recognition as a guitarist. It was it was fantastic, and it kind of carried on over into the eighties, of course, because Asia was very successful with his first album. Sure. And then that's when I got another guitar award, and they said, "Well, you can't have any more. It's five years, and then that's it." So I said, "Well, thank goodness for that." And then, of course, my friend Steve Morse became uh, the top guitarist straight away after me, and I was very proud. I mean, it's so, interesting you, you say about Chris Charlesworth writing the book with you. I mean, Melody Maker is almost like Yes had a re reservation on the front page for for most <laughs> all of the seventies. It was usually a picture of you pulling a face and and doing a solo or. Uh, well, it, it maybe isn't surprising you mentioned that, but it's very surprising that earlier I was flicking through and looking at different places, and, and that's one of the places I look was right. when I say that you know Melody Maker uh, used these uh, live shots of me very very often and, and put yes across the front, and it was me with that lovely one seven five. So basically, mm. I was very lucky, you know, to to get used like that, um, you know. I think it might have caused a little envy at times because it wasn't really fair, you know, the one guy. But I was being picked out and singled, and maybe there was something about the excitement. You know, I think the whole mm. band was great at that time. I mean, Yes Songs uh, is documents really a band that that really did have electricity. You know, mm. of, of a very. I mean, you couldn't repeat it. I mean, it's not. You know, it can't. You know, it. it, it, it there's something. You know, when you get the originators, it's very, very good. It doesn't mean to say any, everything else pales to, to, to being unimportant, of course, not at all. But basically, uh, as a record of, uh, of a band that uh, worked, worked together very, very well, um, mm. then something like Yes Songs demonstrate and, the kind of things that we did. And um, you're very warm about going for the one in the book as well. That seemed to be that whole Swiss experience and you in the, the hotel with the family. And yeah. it just seemed everything sort of came together at that point. It kind of did. Um, I mean, you know, also I kind of hint, don't I, in the book really, that, that there are a lot of like nice facades to our world in Yes. And also there were some struggles and battles and, and winnings and losings as we went along. And, and I think that's only fair to include because it's a kind of a, a, an honesty that uh, I couldn't really hide. Um, so, but I did notice that one thing I don't always do is, is I'm not always serious. Mm. <laughs> and there's little like in brackets, little things sometimes that I saw a couple of in my uh, little journey through some moments. And I was quite pleased about that because it's, you know, I, I, I do rest sometimes on the, um, tongue-in-cheek side rather than the sort of you know I, 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 I'm not sure that people want to read 
books, you know, about your, you know, your addiction or your, your, you know, how long you spent in hospital or how much hmm. money you wasted getting yourself out of your brain. You know, I mean, I think that's really, really boring, immensely boring. Mm. So yeah, I might touch on a few little fun outings I had during the early seventies, but you know, in the most part, I, I try and treat it as a positive experience, mm. but um, I, I, you know, I don't think, you know, too much sadness makes for a good biography. Although, of course, that's, that's really depending on how honest you want to be. I guess there was a cut off point, you know, with things, you know, um, with everybody there must be but uh, mm. i certainly don't want to harp harp on anything no. that, that causes uh, that kind of consideration and i think one think... of the sorry steve mm. i was gonna say one of the but lovely I... things is the balance you've got between that light and shade where you know you certainly don't pull any punches on yes politics in there at times really. but you're also you know appreciate when it works and when you know what you have and what you had and what you yeah. continue to have so well of course all my yesterdays is taken uh, from you know it's a bit of a, 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 a pun on, on yes of course in a way and and, and that, that seems good and uh, of course i mean yes now i continued it on after 2008 with with chris squire and, and alan whiteman and chris Barstone. You know, we, we've uh, augmented the band beautifully with mm. Jeff Davison and, and Billy Sherwood. Alan White's still thumping away and Jeff Downs on keys. And so Billy Sherwood's been absolutely great on, mm. on filling a very big position. But um, when you look back uh, across the whole run of the book, really, I, I, I see that middle period also when I wasn't in Yes, you know, the 80s uh, was challenging because, you know, not only were drums kind of suddenly a machine and there was a lot of talk about, oh, it's keyboards, you know, there's no room for guitars. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not going anywhere. Well, Steve Hackett and I weren't going anywhere because we had GTR. That's right. But then, you know, ABWH was a very special band because, you know, Although we didn't have the wonderful Chris Squire, we had Tony Levin, and we made our own group of people who who wanted to work together in in that certain kind of way, you know. But of course, everything's a kind of gamble, and you know, you step one way and it, you, you gain something, and sometimes you step another way and you you lose a little. But I think then the early '90s taught me a lot about self sufficiency and how I was really dedicated to making solo albums and doing solo tours. And I did a few of those uh, across, you know, the, 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 the whole period. But I guess bands, you know, that's there's a thing about me and bands. You know, I've been in bands and I'm still in a band. Mm. <laughs> so even though you know it would seem like a a, a a simplistic heaven to just be a solo guitarist, you know, um, it would be actually, you know. Um, but uh, you know, I, that wouldn't totally do it. So I, I've got to kind of wrestle with finding a balance and sure? uh, that, that's what I do and that's and what I enjoy and that's why when I tour with any band you know I, I do some solo guitar playing because I'm not going to let that be forgotten mm. <laughs> or rather that I want to play my that kind of music as well you know because it is part of the other music it isn't separate you know it's not like it's alien or it's overly classical or you know so I, I see a thread you know uh, you know, in in, uh, in in the way I appreciate the guitar, I guess, and other guitarists, which is really, uh, again, you know, something I, I'm, you know, uh, full of praise for, because um, I think if you're uh, not listening, then you're not getting the picture, and I listen. Sure, <laughs> sure. sure. And, and that's, you know, you, you talk about the 80s. I mean, Asia, for me, are... A great blind spot i adore yes you know i've got lots of offshoot stuff i got the component parts of it yeah. and i've still after apart from the hit single i've never heard an asia track because i was on the other side i went off to listen to frankie and abc and things like that which of course you had a role in in frankie as well i, I could always smell the prog there somewhere but what i mean I, i'm fascinated what what would you recommend to listen to of asia of asia yeah. Well, I mean, really, the first album is a is a chunk of work that, that encapsulates quite a lot of John Wetton's writing for some period before before that. And, and of course, you when at my suggestion we got Jeff Downs in, um, that they became a great team writing. So I I, I find that whole first album very kind of um, 
thoughtfully structured and, right. and dynamic, you know, things like uh, Time Again and uh, uh, Without You, you know, shows a kind of another side of the, 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 the arranging. Um, uh, John was always great when he played music that he didn't write as well, and he, he moves around on the bass a lot more when he's got some music of mine, and that's what happened in Here Comes That Feeling, you know, and uh, so, I mean, uh, you know, you, I don't know whether you wanted me to suggest one song. Well, but no, no, I, no, but just the like, first um, album, you yeah, know, is okay. really captured. I mean, if that band could have, you know, not been rushed into the next one, all these butt, butt, butts, yeah, yeah. you know, and actually kind of got into a nice working route of doing albums like that, it would have been marvelous. Um, so when we did the reunion, we, we tried to make sure we made some fairly, you know, some of the reunion stuff's quite actually quite nice that we did from 2006 onwards with <laughs> the albums, but. Basically, that first album carries all the signposts, you know, you need for what Asia was, was thinking we wanted to be. Sure. And it wasn't like, yes, it wasn't like ELP. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't like UK or, or, or Suicide King Kingdom. But um, we certainly did play those bits of music on, on one tour where we, we did our career music, you know. And Asia playing Roundabout was kind of kinky. Wow. Uh, but yeah, you know, John sung it really great. John, John uh, yeah. that sung it really great. But it was great fun playing Fanfare and, you know, um, Court the Coons and King, even, you know, Video Killed the Radio Star. Sure. <laughs> because right. that was Jeff's, you know, big thing. Oh, sorry, and, yeah. Yeah. and of course, one must always talk about Trevor Horn. Drama is a fantastic album, as is Fire From Here. Um, but I love that fact you were sort of like, you know, you played on sessions for Propaganda and, and Frankie and um, I mean, that that seemed like a fun time as well, where all these things were sort of happening. Yeah, it was. I'm sure I did other sessions that I don't, I don't know ever what happened to, but they were all fun. And I guess that was, you know, as, as I've described in the book, you know, that was something I took on board. You know, I quite liked going in cold thinking I was just popping in to say hi. And suddenly, oh, well, look, since you're here. Yeah, you know, so I'd hear these words, since you're here, have you got a guitar? And sometimes I did in the car, you know, or he had something, you know. But um, yeah, I mean, just the, the kind of community, there was a community, it went, it went around that time a lot and it was happening. I mean, I was going from sound working on something maybe slight or just hanging out, you know, with Trevor or Steve Lipson and saying hi. And then I was going to the townhouse where Jeff, you know, was producing GTR. And uh, you know th th that already that was quite a, uh, a quite a mixed bag. So um, the recording's flashing. Does it always flash, or does it flash when it's running out of time? Uh, is that more? I don't know. I think it flashes when it's recording. Actually, I think it flashes when it's recording. Yeah, it's yeah. Still going. Otherwise, we have not been recording. <laughs> no, but I'm sure you're right. Sorry to it worry. It's recording here. It says it proves we're live. It's, it's like a recording. We're live. Yes, it's definitely. <laughs> if we're not, we'll have to do it again tomorrow. Um, oh, yeah. Or just have it as a lovely memory. Um, so there it is. Yeah. All my yesterdays. Um, you are now at a point. I mean, obviously, this is probably the longest you haven't been on the road since 1964 yeah <laughs> um you i mean love is was a beautiful album again that sort of got caught in the lockdown a little bit but yeah we delayed it till uh, july yes sure sure and i mean that's a tremendous work just uh, i mean it's basically completely you with dylan on drums and then a few guests here well, just john Davidson on harmonies and bass on the songs yeah so it's uh, it, it, it was all prepared like the book. It was all prepared last year. Yeah, and I didn't do anything on it. It was just like we timed it to come out in April around the time of the book. So it just had to come back late, delayed. Yeah, thank you. Sure. No, it's lovely. Dylan's playing on it is really vibrant. I mean, the two of you playing together. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, we've we've done so much work together. It's beautiful. beautiful. Sure. Sure. Um, no, that that is lovely. So that's out, and you're also doing the the the, the home grown series yeah the homebrew series continues yes um i'm up i've done six now of this like really eclectic kind of weird stuff and yeah I, i'm i'm preparing homebrew seven for early next year homebrew, not homebrew. because i mean time, yes. there's some sort of, on that last one there's no disguise i mean a group will build a career out of that tune and it just seems to be one you just you know did that before breakfast and uh, i've got another five to come later <laughs> 
I mean, you, you've always had this tremendously commercial ear amongst all the Yeah, it's, it's funny, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know how to really describe that, but I mean, you know, it was unfashionable in the 70s to like ABBA, but I loved them and I told people, you know. So um, there's always been great pop, you know, there's no doubt about it. Some of it is, I mean, Eddie Cochran, you know, come on everybody, mm -hmm. is really a piece of pop, but it, it's classic. So the classic, classic, all the way along, there is classic bits of pop. So, um, yeah, I, I've been influenced by um, everything, <laughs> mm. everything I've heard in some way or another. And, um, yeah, I, I do quite enjoy that, that side of things when, uh, when it feels right. So, obviously, we're slightly governed by the situation we're all in. But, I mean, in the perfect world, um, what, what is next for you? <laughs> or, so Relayer is is that's the next when the well, Yes it, machine comes out. When, yeah, when Yes get touring again, um, we'd love it to be next April, but we're, it may have to be later. And it, we will be featuring the album Relayer and yeah. building a set around that idea. One album, uh, in, in, one album from beginning to end. Um, sometimes we do two albums. But this time it's going to be one, and the other set is is you know is is a, a, a crossbreed, if you like, of of some of the things we feel we ought to play. Mm. Um, we don't like to be hundred percent predictable in that ever because that's that's boring. So we we but tend to roundabouts at the end and <coughs> well, starship trip. There are some, <laughs> there are some unavoidables which we love. I mean, roundabout has got to be you know for yes uh, something that we'll, we'll all, we would always play. So yeah, we, we love it and we, we'd like to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, we hope to have, um, you know, other projects that, that are meaningful and, uh, and um, you know, timely, you know, um, to, to work around. So yeah, um, it, it, it's a time of um, not exactly, not hibernation in the sense of, um, you know, uh, actual, but a kind of a, uh, you know, the, the curtains are drawn, the doors are shut, the people are getting on, but hopefully that will end uh, and we'll get back to something that we that we know and love, um, which would be more, more communication, more ability to, to tour and do things, and um, optimism and uh, faith, you know, and hope. Sure. <laughs> and a few other things. Sure. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. It's, um, well, who knew when uh, <laughs> all of this... Uh, was going to happen a very bizarre time but what I will say is it's on omnibus um we're putting this out before Christmas do uh an ideal stocking filler to go with your love is album and also that the last um the yes from Vegas album oh. I would say is in the top quarter of of yes live albums really great yeah. lovely like choice it. of material on there yeah um, no opportunity necessary. So, yeah, <laughs> no, absolutely. In fact, I've got it here. Look, I've got that's um, a real funny one to play. I can tell you. What that's I loved correct. about that actually was was just yeah. the selection of sort of. I mean, obviously, um, roundabout Starship Trooper, but I loved the face you were going. Sort of, you know, America was played again, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. which is so like an onward and. Um, Yes, I think onwards such a beautiful song. So yeah. there you are. Look at that. It's like I'm a I'm a walking Steve Howard. <laughs> <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Right. Uh, it's been a pleasure, Daryl. Thanks so much for having me, and and thanks everybody for watching. And uh, take care. And hopefully, we'll get down the end of the tunnel where the light is. Let's hope so. Thank you so much, Steve. All right then. Tip for